Hi there everyone, we are at the Bournemouth Natural Science Society with Mark Spencer. What this man doesn't know about moths and butterflies isn't worth knowing. And the collection they have here is extraordinary. We couldn't possibly look at them all, but let's look at some. We're just opening a few random uh, ones here. What have we got there, Mark? Uh, this is an extinct species since 1970 in Britain. This is actually the one that started me on natural history when I was uh, a nine-year-old boy. Oh, and the caterpillars there as well? Yeah, the caterpillar skins. It's quite a difficult out to uh, preserve in caterpillar skins, but we have very many species of adults preserved. Oh, look at those! Yeah, these are the Lycaenid. These are coppers and, and blues and hair streaks. Some of the prettiest little butterflies you can get in this country. The work involved in just displaying them like that and putting the pins in accurately yeah, and spreading a, the wings. A real art, collecting and pinning specimens. You have to do it without any damage to the specimen, which is um, a, quite a nightmare. <laughs> There's some big ones in these ones, I remember saying. Yeah, there are some large species. Oh, yeah. Are, these are foreign species, of course. So we have a large collection of British and foreign from many parts of the world. Surprisingly, some of the most beautiful looking butterflies are actually moths, and it dispels the myth that moths are quite drab and uninteresting. Some species are incredibly beautiful. Coming over to another side of the room now, there's just cabinet after cabinet. Let's just uh, do another lucky dip, shall we? Many of these specimens were collected uh, in foreign climes, these in Malaya. Each specimen, of course, is available to people who want to do scientific studies. They can actually come in and examine the specimen in detail if, if they wish to do so. But let's come to something that you might notice if you're here. And this is a name you'll see in a few places. Margaret Brooks Collection, bequeathed 2006. Who is Margaret Brooks? She was a personal friend of mine. She was a lifetime member of the society. And unfortunately, she died in 2006. We spent a lot of time in the field together, uh, doing mothings and field trips, looking for butterflies. The only thing we disagreed on was gardening. OK, well, you, <laughs> you can't agree on everything. No, that's true. Margaret Brooks, who I hadn't heard of until today, literally wrote the books on British butterflies and moths. These are two of like the really important tomes in the world of butterflies and moths here in the UK. In fact, this was the first time ever that all the British butterflies had been put into a book uh, in photographic form, all the life cycles of them. Luckily for us, Mark here, because he was such good friends with Margaret, has a lot of objects from Margaret's life. He's brought them in from home and we're gonna go and have a look at them right now over here, come on. First of all, and there are drawers and drawers of these here, are slides of pictures that Margaret took. I can grab one at random. We have here a slide. Oh, I've got a big glass dump on it. <laughs> Let's have a look, what is it, is it a butterfly or a moth? Or? Purple Emperor, this is a picture yeah. of a purple emperor. Purple Emperor butterfly. Some were taken in the wild, but most were taken actually from captive bred specimens. Wow. It would take many decades to do the same thing in the field. She bred every single British butterfly in captivity for the book. So we've got slide after slide after slide. It's about 100, 150,000 slides. Look at this, people. I actually <laughs> ended up possessing Margaret's camera. This is the uh, camera. She took most of the photographs with. Look at that. This is butterfly history, people. <laughs> I can see you, James. And in fact, she took the eggs and the tiny larva uh, using this camera and this microscope in combination. She'd actually put eggs and small larva on the viewfinder and she would actually connect the camera on the top of this and connect it with black tape so she stopped the light coming in. It's quite amazing how it was done. Have a look at this, people. The actual kite net of Margaret Brooks. This is what she would have caught a great many of her specimens with. So this is like having Babe Ruth's baseball bat or something like that. This is very like... much like that, yeah. yeah. And she didn't always collect them, of course, they were caught for live breeding in the same fashion. You, you collect butterflies from the wild to breed them in captivity. Can you show me the technique of how one catches yeah. a butterfly? Or? Ba basically, the, the kite net is a bit of a cheat. It's got a nice, nice big shape. When you've got circular nets, it's far easier for the insect to escape. So what you do is basically scoop the net and you fold it immediately. Uh. And when you've folded it like this, you then use what's called a pill box to take the butterfly or moth out of there. Yeah. And I've actually got some of Margaret's original pill boxes here. They were actually made from stiff old cardboard pill boxes and you had a special glass cut to put in the base. So they're extremely strong and they're very good to see this specimen in once you've caught it inside the pill box. Yeah, you can have a look. They're really nice and sturdy. And they sturdy. also fit one inside the other, yeah. You can't buy pill boxes like this anymore. Don't make them like they used to. They don't. Yeah. And these are my precious possessions uh, from Margaret because <laughs> really? you can't get them anywhere else. Mark mentioned that he goes on mothings and that brings us to our final object today. And it's very special because 
It's a living object. It's not something you would normally find here. It's been brought in specially. Let's go and have a look. This particular specimen is a death's head hawk moth. A death's head hawk moth. And it's called that because of the skull-like marking on the thorax. Oh, look at that, yeah. But weirdly, humans are the only creatures on the planet that are scared of skulls because of superstition. Yeah. Of course, what the moth's actually trying to look like is a gigantic wasp. You see the stripes? So she's got a striped abdomen in yellow and black, which looks exactly like a giant wasp or a hornet. And everything is sensibly scared of wasps and hornets. So it is trying to look intimidating. Yeah, it's trying to look intimidating. It's all bluff. Uh, it I'm a little bit scared of it. It can't hurt you at all. Although there are many people across the planet that are really scared of this moth. One of the weirdest things it does is it invades honeybees hives and steals their honey. If it's challenged by the bees, it produces a squeak and the squeak is an imitation of the queen honeybee telling the hive that everything's okay, calm down, there's no problem. So the honeybees allow it to steal their own honey. Why is it not flying away? It's a night flyer. Also, they like to fly at around about 30 degrees centigrade. How often is it that in this country? Well, in fact, even in the tropics at night, it isn't. What they do is they rev their wing muscles without actually taking off. It raises the body temperature by friction up to 15 to 20 degrees above air temperature, and then they take off. When they take off, this moth can do 35, 40 miles an hour. It's wow. a very powerful flyer. There you go, people. We finished with a death's head hawk moth there on one of the white gloves. That's a first. Shall we let it go back into its house? She's waking up a little bit now. She's vibrating her wings. Has that got a name? Well, I haven't given her a personal name, no. Oh. Unfortunately, they don't live long enough. Oh. As adults, you're lucky three or four weeks. Can I you give can that one a name? It. You can give her a name. I'm, I'm going to call that one James. James, OK, <laughs> fine. Well, it's actually a female, then. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You know what I'm going to ask? Of course, yeah. Can I turn you it? You can turn it. It's a little bit stiff, but you can, yeah, the planets will move. Here we go. Oh, so the, the, moon. Moon, the moon is moving intermittently. Yes, it's a bit sticky. I don't know if there would ever be a point where I'd get bored of doing this. You might actually need to just like actually ask me to stop. <laughs> if this was to scale, do you think Saturn would be like down the end of the street? Oh, yeah, it would be very far away. So I really want to take this apart and like go inside and clean yeah. all of the mechanical sections, put it back together. A bit of WD-40. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 